Namaskar and welcome to Indian Diplomacy, show on uh, India's national television channel Doordarshan about uh, India's international relations, Indian foreign policy and global developments and initiatives that have an impact on India's rise. Viewers, in this episode, we are taking up uh, China's gigantic Belt and Road Initiative or BRI, which has completed 10 years in existence and uh, is undergoing a major metamorphosis. What has been the impact of the BRI on the world and on China's uh, position in the world? This is the focus of uh, this episode. And to discuss uh, this, I have uh, with me, joining me from Taipei, Taiwan, uh, Dr. Sana Hashmi. Dr. Sana Hashmi is uh, a noted commentator and expert on uh, China and the uh, Greater China region, and also uh, is at the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation. She's worked in India's Ministry of External Affairs as well, and uh, is keeping the Indian flag flying in Taiwan. Dr. Hashmi, welcome uh, to Indian Diplomacy. Thank you, I'm delighted to be on the show. Dr. Hashmi, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, 2013, uh, President Xi Jinping launched it with a lot of fanfare and called it the project of the century. And uh, by some estimates, the Chinese have uh, invested uh, in excess of one trillion US dollars uh, in this mega connectivity, uh, industrialization and infrastructure uh, project that links Asia, Africa and Europe uh, and even beyond if you include their uh, digital, uh, so-called digital Silk Road. So if you think about it now, in hindsight, uh, they've completed 10 years and have commemorated uh, the latest forum where they have talked about uh, how this project is going to continue. But if you just look back at it uh, and, uh, and, and dissect the um, phenomenon of the BRI, which is closely associated with China's rise and China's power in the world, uh, what would be your initial thoughts about how this has gone, why they launched it. Let's start with why they launched it and how it has gone. Um, as you rightly mentioned, uh, it, it was launched in 2013 and it was launched as a massive infrastructure and connectivity initiative by China. Uh, and also that this has been equated with the Marshall Plan. When it was launched in uh, 2013, primarily in Indonesia and Kazakhstan, it was a very, very different time for China. And its relationship with the West uh, were very different from how they are today. Mm. So, of course, over the years, the drivers, objectives and motivations uh, why China started this massive infrastructure initiative have undergone significant transformations. Uh, but then talking of why was it actually launched? Uh, I feel that it could be driven by a number of uh, reasons. There were a number of uh, motives that China actually initi she initiated such a huge infrastructure project. So, in my view, the first reason was perhaps that uh, BRI has been tightly linked to Xi Jinping's legacy. Uh, it's, I feel that less connected to the idea of China per se getting its rightful place at the global stage, but it's more about Xi Jinping's legacy. Then, of course, there are other factors as well. Uh, second, this is also an attempt to dismantle the Western liberal international order, mm -hmm. uh, which is mostly dominated by the West and I would say the US. So I would actually say that that was not an initial objective uh, that when it was launched in 2013, but I do feel that at the initial stage, the idea would have been to benefit from the existing international order. But over the years, uh, the pushback that has see, uh, that has been received by the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and a lot of Western countries have pulled out from the Belt and Road Initiative. So I believe that in the backdrop of this context, uh, China has been trying to present itself as a custodian of a regional and global order mm -hmm. that is not led by the Western countries. And the rules have to be set by the developing world. And when we say developing world, we are actually saying that China wants to set the rules of uh, engagement with the world. So the, cho the change in tone is very well noticed during the uh, recently concluded Belt and Road Forum as well. Uh, when she talked about uh, the ideological confrontation, geopolitical rivalry and block politics not being a choice for us. Mm. So there's also an emphasis on us. So the projection of this idea that it has actually become something that is us versus them. Mm. 
Mm. But uh, I feel the difference here is that China is now selling this us versus them idea to the to some of the developing countries through cheap infrastructure, uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative. So I do see that this is a projection of the idea that they're not the Western countries are not fulfilling the needs of the developing world. And what they are instead doing is to focus on uh, fueling the wars all over the world. We have Russia, Ukraine war. Now we are seeing the war in the Middle East as well. Um, and what China has been trying to project as that these countries are focusing on their geopolitical interests rather than the needs of uh, the developing world. And right. In but but, but uh, yeah, Sana, uh, let me interject there. I mean, obviously, this is also a geopolitical project, isn't it? I mean, while the Chinese say that it is purely economic, uh, we know and we have seen around the world how this is closely linked to China's uh, influence and expansion as a major or what they call major power diplomacy. And um, in fact, the choice of the economic uh, means to establish China as a great power, they say is unique because all the previous great powers have uh, established themselves through war and through conquest while we are doing it through economics. But even when you look at the economic aspect, it is geopolitical, isn't it? And it is about ultimately uh, a lot of these projects, as we will continue to discuss in this show, uh, have not really been based on sound economic uh, reasoning, but simply uh, mainly aimed at uh, ensuring that China controls certain key uh, geopolitical spaces around the world, especially in the developing world. No, definitely. As in, of course, as you mentioned, that economics is one of the major objectives behind it, the rationale that has been given by China. But this is not purely economics. And I would actually say there are strategic interests that are more important to China than uh, economics. It, this is all about how, what they're trying to sell and what they're trying to project to the developing world. And in fact, um, of course, as in, if you look at where the uh, Belt and Road Initiative was introduced, it was in Indonesia, Southeast Asia. Uh, the Maritime Silk Road and uh, the uh, land component of the Belt Road Initiative was actually launched in Kazakhstan, Central Asia. So if you look at the importance, the strategic importance of these two regions for China is, is, is immensely important. You look at Central Asia. Central Asia, of course, we have, uh, and when we talk about Belt and Road Initiative and Central Asia, uh, it, the China's cooperation engagement with Central Asia goes beyond uh, Belt and Road Initiative. It was actually started in the 1990s when the Soviet Union was collapsed and how China fast-tracked its boundary dispute resolution with the post-Soviet states. So now we are looking at China, Central Asia, where China has actually become the largest trading partner, largest investor in the region. And uh, Central Asia is also now kind of becoming a bridge between China and Europe as well. Mm. So there are strategic uh, reasons as well. And also if you look at Russia, Russia, after specifically after Russia-Ukraine war, we are seeing that Russia is becoming a junior partner to China. So through investment, through infrastructure projects, this has been made possible that in a region like Central Asia, China is becoming a superior power than Russia. Absolutely. And then you have, and then you have another example that's Southeast Asia. Indonesia was a very very important choice for Xi Jinping in 2013. And look at it as an Indonesian president was at the second Belt and Road Forum, and. Uh, uh, I feel that this is such a huge achievement for China that it was able to uh, develop the first ever high-speed rail in the Southeast Asian region. But does it actually stop in Southeast Asian region? Of course not. It goes beyond Southeast Asia. It goes to the wider Indian Ocean region. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, the parameters of the BRI have uh, continuously expanded just as China's core interests have been expanding as they define it. Uh, but um, viewers, uh, the one of the big fulcrums of the Belt and Road has been Africa. And uh, lately, China has started to downsize its loans and uh, investments under the BRI in Africa. And there's been a reduction compared to the early years of the BRI. And uh, there is the problem of sovereign debt that is rising in a lot of the uh, highly indebted African countries who owe so much to China now that China is unable to absorb the losses and is actually cutting down some of its uh, initial grandiose uh, and overambitious investments in the region. Let's uh, watch this report about uh, the BRI in Africa and continue the discussion. Chinese sovereign lending to Africa fell to the lowest level in nearly two decades, according to data from Boston University's Global China Initiative. The figures underscore Beijing's shift away from a decades-long big-ticket infrastructure spree on the continent. 
The drop in lending comes as several African nations struggle with debt crises. China's own economy is also facing headwinds. Africa has been a focus of President Xi Jinping's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. It was launched in 2013 to recreate the ancient Silk Road and extend China's geopolitical and economic influence through a global infrastructure development push. Boston University's Chinese Loans to Africa database estimates Chinese lenders provided $170 billion to Africa from 2000 to 2022. But lending has declined sharp since a 2016 peak. Nine loans totaling $994 million were agreed last year, marking the lowest level of Chinese lending since 2004. African governments largely welcome Chinese lending and infrastructure projects, but Western critics have accused Beijing of saddling poor nations with unsustainable debt. Zambia, a major Chinese borrower, became the first African country to default during the global health crisis in late 2020. Other governments, including Ghana, Kenya and Ethiopia, are also struggling. China, meanwhile, is facing its own problems at home. Policymakers are struggling to revive growth amid persistent weakness in the crucial property industry, a faltering currency and flagging global demand for its manufactured goods. However, the decline in loans does not necessarily mean an end of Chinese engagement in Africa. The Boston University analysis found trends including fewer loans over $500 million and more focus on social and environmental impacts that appear to reflect China's stated push towards a more high-quality, greener Belt and Road Initiative. So, viewers, there's been some major adjustment in the Chinese BRI. And what we are seeing is uh, there is a shift from uh, what they had initially, which is focused on physical infrastructure, big dams, big highways, tunnels, bridges, uh, railroads, uh, airports, and, and so on, and big convention centers in many developing countries, especially in Africa. And now, as we are seeing, um, the uh, debts, the bad debts have piled up. Uh, China is unwilling to write off the debts and is therefore now uh, trying to downsize its risk uh, and is also bringing in other elements because the criticism has been that China has been spreading a lot of um, pollution throughout the world by financing more and more coal-fired power plants. So coming back to Dr. Hashmi, Dr. Hashmi, um, Africa, a lot of these countries, uh, very, very low-income countries, uh, initially lapped up uh, happily the loans that the Chinese were throwing at them. But now uh, uh, they, they have realized that uh, they took on a lot more debt than they could afford and are unable to repay the Chinese. And now, so there's all these, you know, agonizing negotiations going on with how to roll over the debt and how to restructure the debt. And in some cases, some of these countries have come perilously close to financial collapse. Um, and uh, as much as 40 to 50 percent of the GDP is owed to China now in the form of debt. So uh, when you look at this, um, they say on one hand that China helped build the infrastructure and spurred uh, growth uh, and trade in Africa. Uh, but on the other hand, you have this, you know, if you take a longer term view over 10 years, it's sufficient time for us to make a judgment. It does look like a kind of neo-colonialism. So the debt trap, uh, the term is not wrong. If you look at a lot of these countries that we just uh, heard about and there are many others that are in line and they seem so totally trapped in this in the sense they are unable to emerge out of it because the Chinese don't uh, cancel the debt. They simply say, okay, we will um, you know, restructure and we will roll it over for you to repay in the future. So they've been very, very uh, tight uh, when it comes to uh, demanding the money back and this has not been good for all these developing countries. Um, that's uh, absolutely a major concern, and this is a, actually a fact. This is not just a narrative that's being established by countries that are opposing Belt and Road Initiative. There are substantial reports and evidences that countries in Africa, countries in Southeast Asia, are actually becoming dead trapped. And we have already seen the example of Hambantota port that has been leased to China for 99 years, which is so strategically important for India in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, so definitely, I do feel that China has been using the Belt and Road Initiative as a weapon. So it's also a form of economic coercion, if we could call it. 
Uh, mm. There are countries that are looking for cheap infrastructure. Initially, they actually think that this is infrastructure, this is money without no strings attached. But is it really? We have been seeing at least since 2017, 2018, that countries are realizing that this is just not very feasible for us. We are actually moving towards economic collapse. But then I do not really see any kind of solution to these countries because these countries are economically weaker countries. And mm. Chinese money, Chinese infrastructure, when they're doing everything, but in return, what they want is their strategic interest to be fulfilled. And in the long term, what we are seeing that these countries are actually moving towards uh, financial collapse. But I think in the long term, this is going to happen. This is already happening. Mm. But these countries are just, they do not really have any other alternative. I do feel there's a realization among countries. This is one of the reasons why, for example, India proposed the uh, as, uh, admission of African Union to the G20, uh, there was so much enthusiasm because it was seen as a ray of hope uh, for uh, these countries to actually collaborate with the Western world. And this is one of the reasons why India is actually seen as a credible uh, alternative uh, country that is providing a counter to the Belt and Road Initiative and actually a bridge between uh, Global South and Global North, the developed world and versus the developing world. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Hashmi, there's also the question of the Chinese economy itself. We saw in the report that China's own economy has come to a screeching slowdown, uh, if not a complete halt. And the projections medium to long term are the new normal is going to be just 2 to 3 percent annual GDP growth in China. The same China, which at the time when the Belt and Road was launched 10 years ago, was clocking 7, 8 or even 10 percent per annum, uh, yeah, you know, breakneck uh, speed of uh, economic growth is now uh, much slower. The structural fundamentals are weak. The demographics are getting worse for them. So uh, in that sense also, uh, the second uh, so-called the second uh, BRI 2.0, President Xi Jinping already has said that we we'll, are going to do quote unquote small and beautiful projects only. So it looks like there's a reality check and uh, they are unable to actually sustain the pace of lending and the kind of debts that uh, they had accumulated as a creditor. And I think uh, it, it does look like uh, the BRI, if not, is not going to vanish or not, uh, but certainly is not going to have the same kind of uh, attraction because the money is drying up. And in fact, uh, many people noted that this time, the 2023 Belt and Road Forum uh, in Beijing only had 23 heads of government and state in attendance, when the previous one in 2019 had 37 heads of uh, states and government. So if presidents and prime ministers are not showing up anymore in China for their grand celebrations of BRI, it does mean that they are realizing that uh, maybe uh, the moolah is not going to come anymore. Uh, no, of course, uh, Chinese uh, economy slowdown is also one of the major reasons why we are seeing that a lot of big projects have actually taken a hit. Uh, but also on uh, the question of uh, not a lot of world leaders attending the Belt and Road Forum, I would say that China is also kind of content with the number of attendees uh, it has been able to receive this year. Because if we look at the broader engagement of what China has been doing in the past couple of years, specifically after the pandemic, the first visit uh, that Xi Jinping actually took after three years was in Central Asia. Mm. So I feel that it is more about uh, gathering like-minded friends, uh, countries that are more receptive to the idea of Belt and Road Project. But of course, that doesn't really, uh, we can't really overlook the fact that Chinese economy is also suffering and it will have direct impact on the Belt and Road funding. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we're also seeing within the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, 20% uh, of the projects within the CPEC are either delayed or just canceled. So I mm. think, it, actually the flagship project when we talk about BRI we first talk about the CPEC uh, but apart from that apart from the funding issue apart from the uh, slowdown of the Chinese economy I also feel there is this realization that this is not a good time to start big projects uh, involving multiple countries across regions if you look at the participating countries that actually participated in the latest round of the Belt and Road Forum um, I do feel that it's quite inconsistent and scattered Mm. Well, we saw that there was Vietnam, Indonesia and Cambodia from Southeast Asia, and they have been actively involved uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, projects. Uh, then uh, countries like Philippines are uh, is absent 
and maintaining some distance, specifically under the new administration and after the South China Sea became such an issue between China and the Philippines. Uh, but then if we go beyond the region, we have Europe. From Europe, there's still Hungary that's been a very consistent part of the Belt and Road Initiative. But at the same time, we have a, a entire European Union that there are countries within Europe. They are talking about de-risking. Mm -hmm. And in fact, pulling out of the Belt and Road Initiative is a huge setback. So I feel uh, issues like these and then, of course, corruption, debt trap, diplomacy, uh, then the environmental issues that have become a major cause of concern for China and the countries that are a part of the BRI. Right. Uh, it's, it's, right. So, so it's no longer uh, the kind of uh, the biggest game in town as it used to be, the BRI. Uh, but uh, viewers, uh, coming to India and to our concerns, we have consistently opposed the BRI and we have not joined the BRI because it impacts on India's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And it's also seen as a kind of a containment uh, or encirclement of India uh, by China using uh, economic means. On this point, um, I'd like you to watch a, a small video about uh, Chinese BRI lending in South Asia. And uh, let's watch the, uh, this video about what's been happening in India's neighborhood through the BRI and come back to the discussion. The possibility that Chinese loans to Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and other countries in India's immediate neighborhood could be used as leverage has deeply concerned the United States. U.S. State Department Counselor Derek Cholet stated that we have been very clear about our concerns, not just here in Pakistan, but elsewhere all around the world, about Chinese debt or debt owed to China. Money lent from China has many strings attached. Firstly, Beijing lends at higher interest rates than those charged by the IMF and the World Bank. Secondly, the system does not follow the standard lending borrowing procedure, which only magnifies the risk of the borrower in failing to return the amount. When the borrower defaults, it is then that China's tried and true debt diplomacy comes into play. For example, this new Chinese loan to Pakistan comes after China demanded repayment of 55.6 million USD for the Lahore Orange Line project by November 2023. Spiraling deeper into the Chinese trap, Pakistan appears to be blindly following Sri Lanka's path to its worst financial crisis in decades. China has given billions of dollars in the form of concessional loans to developing nations, mostly for large-scale infrastructure projects. When these countries struggle to make the payments, Beijing is able to demand benefits or concessions in exchange for debt relief. For example, Sri Lanka was compelled to cede control of the Hambantota port project to China for 99 years because of its sizable debt to Beijing. This gave China control over a crucial port and a strategic foothold along with critical waterway for trade and military transportation. So viewers, uh, China has been grabbing strategic real estate uh, from debtor countries that are unable to repay. And this is quite evident from what is happening in our own uh, neighborhood uh, in Sri Lanka, Pakistan and other countries. Uh, so Dr. Hashmi, um, we know the problem, we know that the BRI has been uh, a way to establish Chinese hegemony and uh, we in India have opposed the BRI, we have never uh, joined it. Uh, the Chinese wanted us to join and had applied a variety of means of pressure as well as uh, inducement to get us to join, but we have stayed out and so have uh, other like-minded democracies in the Indo-Pacific. So um, we'd, I'd like you to conclude by talking about uh, the problem in South Asia and whether India, Japan, the US, the Quad countries, the Europeans, we all say that we are uh, for a free and open Indo-Pacific. But on the other hand, the BRI is laying the conditions for an unfree Indo-Pacific and probably an, uh, you know, a colonized or a imbalanced Indo-Pacific. So what can we do now? Uh, we have problematized it enough. We have critiqued it enough. And many countries are realizing that it was uh, a bad dream to take the money from the Chinese. But now what? I mean, what, can, what kind of alternatives can we do? We've recently had the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor, which is on the Western side. Uh, there is the Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Forum launched by the Americans, which we are part of in the, in the Indo-Pacific. 
in the eastern Indian Ocean and beyond. But then uh, ultimately the question is um, what more can we do now? Uh, now that the BRI is slowing down, now that the Chinese are in trouble financially, is this the right time for us uh, like-minded countries, a coalition uh, to come forward and put a real robust alternative so that uh, poorer countries are not uh, con uh, continue to be victims of uh, China's hegemonic policies. I do feel this is the right time for countries to do something. And in fact, India, as you rightly mentioned, India was the first country to oppose the Belt and Road Initiative. And it has never sent any level of representation to any of the Belt and Road Forum. Uh, other countries did send, but eventually they also realized that it is not beneficial for their own interest and for the uh, global interest. Uh, so I do feel that India kind of set a precedence for other countries to oppose the Belt and Road Initiative and see how for what it is. Uh, but over the years, we have seen how other countries have tried to, like-minded countries have tried to present an alternative like Japan's Partnership for Quality Infrastructure, mm. Australia's uh, Development for Assistance to the Pacific Island countries, then US-led B3W and India-Japan Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. But most of these initiatives do come across as an alternative to counter the BRI. But I do see that these are just a subset and most of the time not as effective of their Indo-Pacific policies. And by I do feel that Indo-Pacific construct was also an indirect result of the Belt and Road Initiative, not a direct outcome, but it did have an impact on that. Mm -hmm. So progress has not been really made uh, uh, in terms of presenting an any a counter to the Belt and Road Initiative, and it is definitely important to come with up with a collective solution. And also, and you rightly mentioned about the India. Uh, Middle East Europe corridor, which is definitely one of the most, could be the most effective alternatives to the uh, uh, BRI. But uh, when we talk about the 10 years of the Belt and Road Initiative, and we talk about BRI not going away, we also have to keep in mind that transparency, violating sovereignty, debt issues, these are the issues that are not going to go away. Yeah, and, and, and human rights as well. Uh, Dr. Hashmi, many of these countries uh, especially where there is ethnic strife and all that, the China's BRI has led to crushing the rights and sentiments of uh, those who are uh, struggling for equity and ethnic uh, equality in their countries. So indeed, there are lots of issues. So viewers, what uh, this, this discussion is bringing out is that uh, there needs to be a counter, uh, a solid and a concrete counter to the Belt and Road Initiative and perhaps the slowdown of the BRI uh, as a result of China's own uh, misdeeds is laying the foundation for some kind of an alternative to emerge because now we can compete better, not when the Chinese were at the peak, but now when they are uh, in, in relative decline. So uh, there's much that we can do uh, as democracies. I want to thank Dr. Sana Hashmi for sharing valuable insights. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for your work to promote India-Taiwan uh, ties. Thank you so much. Viewers, uh, let's keep an eye on China's Belt and Road Initiative in its second avatar. Uh, BRI 2.0 promises to be quote-unquote nimbler and smaller, but uh, there is an opportunity for those who have suffered and have struggled against uh, the BRI to stage a comeback now because uh, China is weakening and uh, China's internal weakness is something that uh, one must uh, uh, ca ca capitalize on in order to achieve some kind of a balance, especially in the Indo-Pacific. I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.